I am pleased to uh, introduce Josh Payne. He's Quantopian's Director of Business. And so he's responsible for all the third-party data integrations that we've been bringing to the platform. He's added over 60 data sets in the last year from seven different vendors. Um, but he's gonna show you today how to build a stronger strategy on Quantopian. So it's a little bit of a dive into the product and it should be really exciting to see uh, what he's got to show. So take it away, Josh. Thanks a lot, Karen. Um, Karen and I have known each other for six years. We've worked at two companies together, and she, she, she put the fear of God into me that she was going to be embarrassing me during that introduction. So I'm, I'm kind of gobsmacked that, that, I, that I'm not embarrassed right now. Um, so thanks, thanks for coming. I call this talk, um, as I, we titled the talk, and then I actually developed it. And, and so I give it a different title now after I developed it, which is uh, A Quant's Journey Through Quantopian. So what I really want to do here today is is sort of help you understand how Quantopian can you know act as a as a as a tool for you as a quant um, as you as you go through your workflow uh, in, in pursuing quantitative quantitative finance and, and algorithmic investing. Uh, just some sort of quick introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Josh Payne. Uh, I have about uh, 18 uh, years of experience in the software industry. So I am a, a software professional. I uh, have worked in the Boston area and a variety of different industries, verticals, all in the software software business. Um, and I am only only within the last year and a half while, while working at Quantopian have I focused on finance. So I come at this with deep expertise in building software, uh, creating workflows, and, and creating tools uh, for people across a variety of, variety of industries. Uh, what I'm going to do today is, is walk through uh, a sample idea or a sample strategy, what, uh, what, a, what a community member at Quantopian might do as they work through their, their ideas from the sort of spark of a hypothesis through to validation, uh, research and validation of, of that idea along the way. Uh, I am... Uh, yeah, I, I collaborated on this with our intern extraordinaire, James Christopher Hall. Uh, so all the really smart uh, sort of ideas that are coded up that you see displayed uh, in the tools, James Christopher did. Um, all, all those ideas are his. If there's any sort of flaws in the research, I'm sure it's due to my guidance as to what I wanted and not, not James Christopher. So James Christopher gets, gets all, all the credit. Um, just for folks who might not be familiar with Quantopian, um, Quantopian is a crowdsourced investment firm. Uh, we have a community of over 70,000 uh, quants uh, members who use our, use our tool, use our tools. We are a, a provider of software, data, uh, and educational resources to help anyone, regardless of where they work, where they live, uh, pursue quantitative finance. So now we're really about sort of opening up the, the pursuit of quant finance to anyone regardless of, of, of where you are. Uh, our business model is one of sort of as, a, as an investment firm, so we make uh, allocations to selective, uh, selective members of the community for, for whose algorithms sort of meet our criteria and we share, uh, share in the proceeds. Uh, and that, that's sort of touched on FOSS and uh, touched, touched on by FOSS uh, earlier today. And with that, um, sort of let's, let's walk through the the uh, the quants journey that I spoke about. Um, you know, really, it starts with sort of the spark of the idea, and we'll go through sort of iterative steps. And really, the idea of these iterative steps is so that you're not investing too much time in sort of your back testing and sort of the resource intensive portions of the workflow. Um, and and I think this workflow is akin to say a software development cycle for a product where we at Quantopian or other software companies, we only sort of pursue as much, um, we, we make as sort of small investment as possible to determine whether or not the idea is good. And the same idea applies here in a, in a quants workflow where they're only, and we, we provide the tools uh, to only make, uh, make, make a sort of invest as much effort into your idea as you need to along the way. So, Say I am. Say I am a uh, quant or a member of the community. I come home from dinner one day, and or come home from work one day, and rather than going to grab some dinner, uh, I decide to log on to Quantopian and, and check out uh, what's going on in the forums uh, on Quantopian. Uh, so with that community of seventy over seventy thousand uh, members, 
there's open sharing of ideas uh, in our forums, and this is sort of one of the core, core pieces of, of the software. Uh, there's a community, people share their ideas. They're not necessarily sharing their edge, their special sauce, whatever it is that uh, provides them sort of their alpha, but they're providing tips, tricks, um, sort, of, sort of helpful helpful hints so that other people can get started as well. In this case, uh, I might, you know, I, I'm grabbed by the idea that Song here, my colleague, has posted about, and he's talking about a new data set uh, that's built into Quantopium. Uh, in this case, uh, it's using uh, data from a firm called PsychSignal. They provide their data to quant firms. They also have integrated uh, or provided their data for integration uh, into Quantopium. And this, you know, this catches my eye because as, a, as, a, as, as someone who's in the community, I'm really interested in, uh, in, in sentiment and sort of you know, harnessing, say, stock twits, Twitter, sentiment, uh, you know, sentiment analysis as a potential signal. I've always thought that that's an interesting idea. So I go, I check out what Song, uh, Song has written here. Song has done a little sample algorithm, um, but he also sort of provides a link back over to the, the data page here on Quantopian. You can see here on the navigation menu. And I say, not, you know, I, go, I go search for sentiment, and not only do I find that psych signal data, um, and that psych signal data takes stock twits, sort of messages, Twitter messages, and assigns what they call trader mood to it or a sentiment, um, and determine bearish and bullish measures for each uh, for each stock each day based on Twitter and, and stock twits, and that's really interesting to me. But there's other sentiment vendors here uh, inside inside the, the inside the, the Quantopian Partner Program as well that I can, that I can play with. Uh, there's one from Centex. Centex uh, is a little more focused. They go grab data from, they go grab news stories from 20 financial uh, news outlets, CNBC, Wall Street Journal, Yahoo Finance, and so forth, Forbes, uh, and do sentiment analysis and natural language processing on it. So that's interesting to me as well. Uh, and then Acern, uh, who's actually speaking here uh, later in the day, uh, Acern does a broader spider. They go and grab uh, you know, millions and millions of news sources, blogs, uh, you know, news sites as well, and do similar sort of natural language processing and sentiment analysis. Each of these data sets has been integrated onto the platform. Um, so me as the quant, I don't have to worry about going and, and sort of doing the crawling and grabbing the data and doing the natural language processing and determining, you know, what stock is mentioned in the news. All this is pre-built, pre pre-integrated into Quantopium. Uh, we've done the mapping for you. It's all, it's all there. So now, instead of having to do a lot of the plumbing, a lot of the heavy work with all these ex external data sources, I can just get, get into the nitty gritty of sort of pursuing my idea. And so I might, in this scenario, say, you know, I'm going to sort of look into the possibility of using one or a few of these uh, sentiment data sets uh, in a strategy. And uh, each of these data sets provides me a free sample. So I haven't had to I haven't had to you know, pay anything, it's all free. I can look at broad swaths of this historical data uh, on Quantopium uh, to research my idea and sort of validate and start to validate or invalidate my hypothesis uh, through, through research. So that brings me over to uh, the research environment and, and I'll pop over. And so that first step for me, and, you know, now that I'm sort of starting, starting to write a little bit of code, is to go to our research environment and use uh, those free data sets that we get from the partners and start to look at it in combination with the free market data and fundamental data that's also uh, integrated in. So what we've done here on Quantopian is all these data sources uh, are coming from disparate places and we are sort of unifying them onto the platform and doing say the symbol mapping so that you don't have to worry about that. It's all sort of mapped universally. And so my first, my first step here on Quantopian uh, within research might be to just like do a basic sniff test of this data set. Like my first, I'm skeptical of any of, the, of all data, right? Uh, you know, who knows what the quality of this data is? Is it decent quality? Is it even worth my time? Or is it going to be a total waste of time? So what I'll do here is go, uh, so import each of these free data sets here. Um, and then, and then pull them out. And what I'll do just for my sniff test is like, I'll, I'll look at it for Apple, right? If these guys, if there's like decent data for Apple, like that's a sort of a reasonable, a reasonable sniff test just to make sure that the data is available. So I'll, I'll grab this data for Apple for each of these data vendors. I'll put it into a pandas data frame. And then 
I'll also go grab market data uh, down here in this line. I'll go grab uh, market data for Apple as well and get the daily price of, of Apple and uh, throw that into a data frame as well. And then I can start to just do some charting of Apple's stock price against the sentiment uh, for Apple from each of these three data sets. So in this case, I can go look at you know, Psych Signals, uh, Psych Signals uh, sentiment for Apple and chart it against Apple's price. The Apple price is in gray. Uh, stock the stock to its uh, trader mood, what is what stock Psych Signal calls it, is, is charted here in red. And for the, for the uh, sentiment vendors, it's actually pretty noisy. So what I, what I ended up doing was throwing in a rolling mean. So we do a trailing window of 20 days uh, just to smooth that data out. And I can start to examine the, the chart and see whether or not there's you know, any kind of correlation that I can eyeball and, and start, to, start to help my, my thought process along. And if, I, if I'm looking at it, it looks like there is some, some nice correlation here between stock twits and, and the stock price. Maybe this sentiment is predictive of, of, uh, of, of price movement. Um, or there's, you know, it, it's possible. Um, and that's what I'm going to be looking for. So my hypothesis here is like maybe sentiment in a very naive, very naive uh, sort of example. Uh, the naive example is like sentiment yesterday is going to be predictive of tomorrow's price movement. Um, and for the purpose of, of, this, uh, of this demo. You know, next I'll go look at Centex as well. And I can chart it in the same way. In this case, maybe there's a little you know, sort of opportunity for sort of contra play. Maybe you know, high sentiment means I should be selling, and low sentiment means I should be buying. You know, maybe that's a valid idea as well. Uh, I can I, I see that, but the data looks good enough. I look at a CERN sort of similar kind of story, so it, it passes sort of that first level filtering of research. I haven't written a back test yet. I haven't gone into sort of a, and, and run run any kind of any kind of strategy yet. So they look good. Sure. How, so when you're gathering the data sets to measure sentiment, mm -hmm. how are you substantively evaluating the data to determine whether the sentiment is positive or negative, whether it has an effect on the sentiment? That's that's what we'll do next. Oh, okay. Right. We're just we're just making sure that like when we open up the box from these sentiment vendors that they just that they didn't put in garbage, right? That there's like data is you know, data is always dirty. It's just a matter of how dirty and messy it is. In this case it looks, you know, not you know, not not so dirty uh, dirty enough, just 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 clean enough that I am I'm I'm happy to then start to go look for uh, sort of its predictive value. Like is it predictive of of a price movement? And so with my next with my next uh, with my next step, I'm going to do uh, sort of a simple, I'm, I'm going to put that simple naive strategy into, into practice uh, with, uh, with factors that is a concept in, in the Quantopian platform. So Quantopian in the last year introduced uh, an idea, uh, or a new portion of our API called the Pipeline API. The Pipeline API, is, is its purpose is to sort of better facilitate cross-sectional analysis. What it allows you to do is force rank stocks uh, on whatever sort of ranking factors that you want uh, through, uh, for, for all stocks available on a daily basis. So I can create a ranking factor for every single stock available to Quantopian on a particular day using factors that I define. So I can define a factor based on price. I could just like the most naive factor I can imagine would be like just rank things top to bottom based on its share price, right? I can, I can use raw data like that. I can use our fundamental data from Morningstar that's, that's free of charge. I can use a fundamental factor and rank things based on say return on equity or its earnings per share or whatever, whatever sort of fundamental metric I wanna use, I can, I can force rank the stocks. Uh, I can also use this sentiment calculation, and these sentiment calculations are basically like you know, they're different from vendor to vendor, but they're like negative one to one, or you know negative five to five, or zero to five ranking of the sentiment of a stock. Um, I can use those sentiment calculations from these vendors to force rank the stocks, and what I can also do is sort of combine them. Uh, combine different calculations, right? I could conceptually like take each of these sentiment vendors and, ca and multiply all three uh, sentiment values together to create a new, 
a new factor, or I can take some uh, sort of fundamental factor and combine them through sort of arithmetic operations, but I can also use them for filtering and uh, screening opportunities, right? If someone's sort of sentiment is below zero, then I automatically take it out of, out of my universe of stocks. So it's a way to rank and sort the stocks for determining what my trading book should look like. And sort of the canonical use case for this uh, is pipeline API and these factors is, is to build long short uh, strategies. So to go, you know, build a market neutral uh, strategy with large, large numbers of stocks with, large, with a large long book and a, and a large short book. So I could, take, uh, I could take the stocks that most exhibit the behavior and go long on those and the ones that have, say, the, the most negative sentiment and go short on those. And that's what I'm gonna investigate here. Uh, so I'll define here, I define factors um, that I'll, that I'll for, for each, uh, each of these data sets, I'll define a factor that just is a very naive implementation. I will naively rank stocks based on yesterday's sentiment. I will just say, top to bottom, rank the stocks um, based on yesterday's sentiment. And then what I want to do is see whether that ranking is predictive of tomorrow's, of, of a price movement in a stock. And so there's a metric called the information coefficient which is designed to do so. Now, I might sort of conceptually know what the information coefficient is, and I say, okay, now I gotta write a notebook uh, or write the code here to calculate that and, and then sort of assess my factor. Well, good news, someone in the community has already written all the code for you, right? So this is another notebook that was shared, just as Song had shared sort of an algorithm that sort of showed off the, these data set. Here's an asset in the community uh, a, a notebook that does that does this factor factor analysis for you. We call it a factor tear sheet, um, and it's going to calculate the information coefficient for you uh, for each for each of these factors that we've defined, or any factor that you want to define in your own workflow. So I haven't written a strategy yet, right? I haven't sort of done a back test. I haven't dealt with execution or all the all the heavy lifting that that I need to do um, in building out a strategy. All I want to know is is this factor that I can use for for picking stocks is this predictive of a price movement? And so that's, that's what the information coefficient is used for. So you know, we'll do it for each of these data vendors. The good news is a CERN who is here today um, isn't in the room right now. Um, and what we really want to see is, and this is going to be hard, what we really want to see, say, if we want to go long for, on the, the stocks that, are at, that are, have positive sentiment and we want to go short for the negative sentiment, what we want to see is a chart here that looks, that goes up and to the right, like left to right. We want the things on the far left to be negative because that's the sort of negative price movement with the negative sentiment. And we want to have positive price movement up on the right hand side for the stuff with positive, positive uh, sentiment. And when I look at a CERN, I love them. This naive factor, it actually, this is kind of a mixed bag. And it doesn't really, right, it doesn't really have a sort of that clear pattern that I'm looking for. That's fine. This is covering all of the stocks uh, in, in the, this is covering sort of all stocks. What we can also do uh, in this tear sheet is it, it breaks down that analysis on a sector by sector basis uh, as, a, as an alternative way. And you can modify it for some, on some other sort of axis or some other criteria. Um, and so I can look at the different sector codes that, uh, that our Morningstar data sort of breaks down, breaks down the universe and see if maybe there's a specific sector that um, shows, shows that sort of telltale uh, sort of up and to the left. And unfortunately for a CERN, uh, it, this particular factor doesn't look great. Don't tell them. Um, I can move on uh, to Centex. Fabulous data set. They have got uh, all lots of other strategies that show re really good returns, positive correlations. Check them out. In this particular case, not great. Um, Centex uh, is another one. They're the ones that focus on financial news sites. And looking at sort of the overall uh, sort of the overall sort of full universe that actually looks pretty good, right? The, the stuff on the left is mostly negative and the stuff on the right is mostly positive. So that's pretty good. Um, it's not a, sort of a, a straight line, but I'll, so I'll keep on digging. And then what really strikes me, you know, catches my eye is the first one here on the, the top left uh, sector. That is, um, the basic materials sector. Let's see if I can sort of blow it up a little bit for you. Or if I just, uh, the, this one right here, right? That looks great, right? That's actually what we're looking for um, in this factor analysis. It shows on the far left-hand side, the bottom 
goes goes has sort of a it predicts an, for negative sentiment uh, stocks it predicts a sort of a strong negative movement the next decile up sort of the the minus 20 you know the 10 to 20th percent also shows sort of negative a negative price movement um, from ye based on yesterday's sentiment and on the right hand side we show exact opposite positive sentiment both so the top 20 percent if I'm looking right right over here positive sentiment positive um, positive price movement so that's that's actually really cool now I'm actually pretty excited when I see that that's if I want to build a long short market neutral strategy that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of behavior that I'm looking for so uh, I say to myself what have I what have I learned so far if I take sort of new sentiment and and uh, focus it down on are ba you know companies that are in the basic materials sector these are companies that focus on mining aluminum uh, those sorts of companies the sort of the company that i always think of in this sector is alcoa um, alcoa for a couple reasons one when i was a kid they used to have awesome ads during nfl football games i don't know if anybody remembers that that's why i like alcoa one guy remembers um, and uh two their ticker is AA. So whenever you sort things by, you know, ticker symbol, they're almost always at the top, right? You, you know, AA. They're like AAA locksmiths. They're they're at the top of you know symbol symbol for strength. But Alcoa is a sort of one of these companies. And I want to take a step back here and say to myself, like, what's the like what's the underlying economic hypothesis? Can I can I actually sort of layer on or sort of sort of, sort of attribute this behavior to an economic hypothesis that makes sense? Um, and I think I can. So, you know, these, these companies in the basic materials segment, they're not the most exciting stocks in the world. They're not the most exciting companies. People are not, you know, people are not really talking about them in the mainstream press. This is like absolute opposite of Apple, right? Apple is super noisy. Consumer goods companies are super noisy. Um, but in this case, the new sources that we're drawing from are financially focused. And these are pretty boring companies. You're not going to get ratings or a lot of click or a lot of clicks on your news site by by writing about Alcoa and these other and mining companies. Um, and so I think there's you know there's probably a sort of a strong amount of essentially signal in this data because like there's there's not going to be there's not going to be noise like nobody's sort of writing about Apple. No one's writing about Alcoa unless there's sort of a legitimate news story, some sort of legitimate market. Um, market influencing story on it. So it, it seems like it makes sense to me. Um, it's not, you know, I can convince myself that there's a chance it's not some sort of spurious sort of correlation. So I'm going to take that factor, right? I've, I've built it here in research. I've written the code and I'm going to do some more sanity checking on it um, and, and with some other sort of basic factors that I, that I can write here in research in, in a notebook. So in this case, James Christopher has a couple of other sort of simple factors that uh, that he knows are sort of relatively predictive, um, you know, something like say dollar, you know, sort of the dollar volume, sort of the, the volume of of uh, of trading on the the stock uh, and the return on equity. So we built two other simple, just a couple of simple factors to see if they actually correlate. Uh, this this new factor that I've built. Does it correlate to some other existing factor? And, you know, is this is this simply a proxy for some other factor that that contains signal? Um, I can check the correlation for that. Again, haven't written a back test yet. Still skeptical. And I see the correlations here against those sort of simple factors and whatever other factors I may have in my in my back pocket. You know, are are pretty low. It's you know point point one. You know, negative six negative point sixteen. It's it's not it's not super, these. This new factor that I've built, this naive sort of Centex basic materials factor, is uh, is is not highly correlated, and with that, um, I'm ready to start the process of sort of formally sort of fleshing out my my algorithm and and build out my pipeline factors. Like what what exactly am I going to do to create my book? And I can sort of do this analysis in research still. To really sort of get my mind around the the book that I'm going to create, my long and short book, what's what are the factors that I'm going to use to really sort of flesh out flesh out this strategy? Um, so this is a lot of the code that I need to start to work on it. And what I'm going to do is, and this is the code that I've built. Um, this sort of defines a bunch of my factors here here in this code in this code. 
Um, and then what I can do in research is chart it out. And that's actually pretty small. Let's see if I can, well, let's close that up, see if we can get a better, better view there. What I can see here um, in this chart uh, is, is all the different factors that I've created uh, to help me define my universe. And what I, you know, now I'm at the point in my workflow where I'm not just sort of taking my alpha, my alpha signal, which is this basic, basic materials sector and the new sentiment, but I'm also doing some, some I'm also sort of putting into place some of my good clean living uh, sort of factors that I use to sort of have a clean universe. Um, so what I don't want to do when I'm trading is uh, trade illiquid stocks, right? So I'm going to create a dollar volume uh, sort of factor here. I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take the volume. I'm going to take the closing price each day and create a you know a, a factor that is the average dollar volume over the past 20 days for a stock. And I'm going to say it has to be in the top 500 sort of liquid liquid stocks and use that as as a ranking factor. And then and then use it use it to mask uh, use it to mask the stocks. So I'm only going to take liquid stocks for my universe. And I don't want to trade some illiquid stuff. I'm also going to go. Uh, over here and grab uh, just stocks for whom uh, the, they're, they're indicated as the primary share because what I don't want to do is mistakenly overweight my portfolio with two, two stocks from the same company, two, share, two separate share classes from the same company. So I just want say, the primary share so that I only have like one, one entry of Alcoa in my, in my book. Uh, not like say both both share classes and, and go out and buy both share classes. And then what I'll also do is is grab the sector code. In this case, I want basic materials that I saw from my factor analysis. I'll go grab the the sentiment, and I'll create factor sort of factors, combine them, and use them to both screen stocks out of my universe, and then do the forced ranking using using the 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 sentiment. So I I use all of, all everything but the sentiment to screen down my universe. And then I use sentiment to, to do that forced ranking. And then what I'm going to do is take the top 20% go long and the bottom 20% go short. And that's, and now that I've done all that zooming, let's zoom way out, way back in, rather, back out, back out. Um, and start to now, now, and only now, right, I'm like seven tabs into this demonstration. Only now am I going to go actually write my full strategy. I can copy and paste that pipeline definition, use that here, right? It's all that, all that same code that I was working on with research. I can build the pipeline. Uh, and then, and what I'm gonna do is build a long book using the top, using the, the long book is based on the top 20%. Um, I'm gonna build the short book using the, the bottom 20%, the, the lowest sentiment basic material stocks. And then, uh, and then, and then sort of set Set that as my set that as the stocks that I'm gonna I'm gonna work with here. Uh, what I'm also gonna do is now that I'm in the development environment, and this is the Quantopian development environment. I should step back and say this is where you fully write your strategy in Quantopian, right? This is where you write not just sort of your screening criteria, uh, but all of the, all of sort of the pieces of the execution for the purpose of the of the simulation. And what I can do here is once I write the code uh, in this in this backtest environment, I can use this, um, this development environment to do sort of sanity checking on the code. I can run some quick back tests that aren't sort of persisted, but I can do them here to make sure that my code compiles properly and I'm getting at least sort of in the vicinity of the behavior that I expect. Um, and I start to sort of get, get some feedback on the returns and I see my logging. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I sort of write out sort of the full, the full algorithm. And what, you, what I'm also going to do is in addition to setting my long book and my short book, I'm also going to schedule when I'm, go when I'm going to sort of execute my trades. And in this case, you know, I, I say I schedule my function, I'm going to schedule my rebalance function uh, every week. And there's a sort of a variety of options that I could take. In this case, I just chose, I chose sort of weekly. But there's lots of, lots of ways that you can, you can play with that as well. Um, and then I'm going to, I'm going to chart, chart things out um, and generally sort of manage, manage the execution here in, in my rebalance. And you can see that we're starting to sort of chart, chart the returns. Um, I can run a fuller back test that's, that's persisted and I did that, I did that prior, uh, prior to this. Um, and we can go check out, we can go check out one of those, one of those fuller back tests. And this is all 
in sample data, right? You know, the f I'm still using that free sentiment data. It's all in sample data. That free data goes up from a fr from sort of a back when back when Centex started to calculate the sentiment to a, sort of a time lag where they're willing to give me free data. If I wanted to do out of sample testing, I'm going to need to buy sort of the most up to date data, and there's a sort of a small subscription fee. In the in the case of Centex, it's ten dollars a month. Um, so, you know, for the price of, you know, four, ice, four, four coffees at Starbucks, you can get uh, Centex data every, every month. Four coffees? Four? 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 Yeah. All right. My Starbucks. My st <laughs> all right. Two, two coffees. We'll call it two. You guys must get like that whipped creamy stuff. I don't know. All the, all, all the, the fancy lattes. I'm a straight ahead guy. Um, so the back test here, my in sample. So I finally, like eight, eight tabs in, I've run, I've run a full back test. And the back test here is going to provide me some of the high level, the high level metrics that, that I'm going to be interested in to assess uh, the strategy. Of course, I'm going to look at the returns. But in this case, I was doing a market neutral strategy. So I see that my beta is, is you know, essentially the, where, where I wanted it to be. Um, oh, in this case, the sharp is 0.5. I thought maybe the other back test. Um, the other back test is, is higher. Sharp's not quite where I want it to be. Um, it, I've done other, other, other back tests where it's about one. Um, I think this is the out of sample test. Um, and you know, this, this, in this tab, it gives me sort of the high level, high level metrics. It helps me, you know, I can monitor, say, my leverage. But if I want to really dig deep in my in sample, my in sample uh, sort of results through the back test, I can hop back into the research environment uh, here in Quantopium. Um, I grab the back test ID and I make use of a library that we call PyFolio. Uh, what, we, what we did uh, through the course of you know, starting to build out our investment firm is create a set of tools for use um, in, in Python for the purpose of assessing uh, different strategies from our community. And it takes it takes the, the sort of the, the exhaust data from, from strategies, from a back test, sort of what the trades were, what the positions were, and builds out a whole rich set of analyses that, that, you, you, can, that you can use. Um, so it's not just these high level metrics. Uh, in turn, we have sort of a, 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 sort of a, a long notebook here of metrics that just by sort of plugging in, plugging in the back test ID, and then running this one command that is sort of create the full tear sheet, I'm gonna get 40, 50, 60 different analyses on my back test. Not only do I get sort of these basic, these basic high level metrics, what my sharp was, what, uh, what my alpha and beta returns, uh, volatility, so forth. I also get the chart, but then I get, you know, rolling volatility against, against the benchmark. I get my rolling beta over time, not just sort of rolled up. I get my rolling sharp. I get uh, you know, in this case, sort of drawdown periods. And actually, you know, as I'm starting to assess my strategy, I'm starting to get a little worried. Um, my in-sample sharp was about one, but I see that there's like lots of some, some long, draw long drawdown periods. And I say, oh, that's, you know, I'll, I'll still plow forward. I'm optimistic. Um, but I also get a whole host of monthly return distribution charts uh, through, through a variety of, uh, uh, through a variety of sort of prisms. And then we also have uh, sort of risk metrics uh, all built into PyFolio that you get just by plugging in this back test. Uh, you'll be able to see, uh, in this case, we ran the back test over a short time frame. Our, pre our market data goes back to 2002, um, but we ran this back test over, only over sort of a, a shorter time frame because that's the only time that we had sentiment data. Um, but in this case, there are, st there are stress events uh, that we can examine in more detail, right? The 08 crash. Um, sort of other 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 things, you know, Fukushima, other, other sort of stress events in in the market over the time frame of 2002 to, to present day that you can examine the behavior of your algorithm, especially for say a market neutral strategy. You're hoping that it still stays pretty smooth through whatever trauma is happening. Um, you can see sort of concentration of positions. Uh, you can see your your gross leverage. There's a whole whole ton of other other things here. Um, so this sort of you know, I might do my analysis here in research again on that back test. I might say to myself, you know, it's, it's pretty good. Um, I, think, I think it's ready for out of sample testing. So it's sort of leapt over or sort of gone past that next hurdle uh, now that I've built it out. I can go back into the IDE um, and go back into sort of that, that data page. I can go purchase that subscription to the sentiment data um, because market data is free 
uh, for, for all time on Quantopian. Fundamental data is free for all time. But the sentiment data, I gotta go, I gotta go make a monthly subscription purchase. So I subscribe for, for $10 for, uh, for that sentiment data. I rerun, I rerun the back test over a longer time frame. Um, and then in turn, I can also start to uh, sort of live trade on a, on a daily basis. Quantopian provides both a paper trading capability through our own, uh, through our own simulation engine. Uh, we provide, uh, and then live trading uh, integration to two brokerages. We, we integrate to Interactive Brokers, who also provides paper trading and, and real money trading on, on your brokerage. And then we also integrate to Robinhood, who provides you know, simply you know, real, money, real money trading. So I could do out of sample testing, both with this new segment of data that I had been too cheap to, to subscribe to during my development process. Um, and then I can do other out of sample testing with that data on a day, day forward basis uh, using, using uh, the, the paper trading capability in, in Quantopium. So in that case, I create another full tear sheet um, and there's an, an, once you have sort of out of sample testing on your, uh, on, on your, once you have out of sample data for your strategy, uh, your, sort of your turn chart, um, we can do some new, newer and different analyses in PyFolio for your, uh, for your strategy. Uh, in the return chart, you'll see a green line uh, that shows the in sample returns. And then based on those in sample returns, we can do a Bayesian analysis to predict the likely returns of that uh, strategy based on its previous performance in sample. So you say, well, based on your in sample, uh, in -sample performance, where you've had a chance to back test as much as your heart desires, we would predict that you know, somewhere in this blue, chart, blue cone, uh, your, your, uh, your, your strategy should, should deliver returns if the, if the return stream maintains, maintains consistency with its previous performance. Uh, so then, in turn, we can chart the out-of-sample returns against, against, against that blue cone and see, well, do, does your out-of-sample performance actually stack up with what we would expect from your in-sample in uh, performance? So we can go down here to our cumulative returns chart and see that, you know, that blue chart is one standard deviation of, of where we would expect it to be, and that red line, unfortunately, doesn't quite, you know, it makes it, makes it into the blue cone uh, periodically on occasion, but uh, at, at the end sort of peters out and is below one standard deviation of what we would expect for, for, uh, for, for that previous performance to say, you know, either, and there could be a lot of reasons, uh, it could be because we've overfit the strategy, uh, it could be that the signal has degraded um, since, since then, but it's still a decent, it's still a decent signal, um, but, you know, at this point in our workflow, you know, we might go back and sort of stash this factor and start to look at other factors that we might sort of want to use in combination with it. It's got a little, it's got some decent performance out of perform out of sample, but not not necessarily the performance we were hoping for. Granted, it was a naive implementation. Um, so with that, that sort of wraps up sort of the the whirlwind journey through the Quantopian platform. Um, happy to answer any questions that you might have all along the way. Yeah. So you said you were of, um, the one thing I've always, I always have a billion taps when I'm working on Quantopian. Yep. Is there a way to crunch like the research and the, and the, uh, the back test and the portfolio results into some sort of, um, yeah, I mean, we're, uh, yeah, we're, we're constantly working to improve the, the workflow. Um, I think we want to make, uh, what's great about the research environment is it provides, uh, Sort of a, a sort of a low commitment place for us to develop new analyses tools, and so I think what you'll likely see us do uh, in the long run is start to start to embed a lot of these analyses uh, back into the core product, so that you're not having to do it sort of ad hoc yourself in in research, right? Um, so when we first launched research, you just had like a blank sheet of paper and all the data and a lot of libraries. Uh, not that weren't PyFolio. You just had like charting libraries and the data, uh, and now we've sort of formalized it with PyFolio. And then I think what we'd like to do is make the the application um, sort of more logical and have and sort of embed this embed this workflow more logically uh, in in the application. To see some of these analyses, which are uh, so sort of frankly better than the ones we've got built into the IDE. They're more in depth, 
um, and sort of exhibit sort of the, the latest in our thinking, get those more embedded into the, into the development workflow. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for your attention. I'll be around. Uh, I'll be around the rest of the day if you have any uh, any other any other questions. Thanks a lot.